First Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, reading. This charge I commit unto thee, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us all turn to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for gathering us in thy house. Above all, we thank you for this most wonderful day of the week, the Lord's Day. Lord, that we can come to worship you. And now at this point, Father, we ask that you be merciful to cleanse us and wash us of all our sins. As we gather, Lord, may you send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Lord, work convictions in our hearts that we may be strong in the faith, be ready to do warfare for you, for your truth. And Lord, may this church be established and strengthened through the teaching of your word. And may thy people be truly soldiers of Christ. We ask and pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we move to the lesson on false teachings in the church, false teachings in the church. Now, God has said that in the end times, there will be many false teachers. There will be many false prophets. Now, one of the things that Christians often struggle with is when they go to a church, and I've not too long back heard of one who I was told that um, this person went to a sound BP church, right? And he loved the church. And he said, well, the, wonderful, the teachings are clear, it's biblical, and got saved. And very soon, he decided that I don't like this church anymore. I want to leave. And actually went to another church. And the reason was this. He said, you know, I don't like people um, criticizing other Christians. It is not good. We should not do such things. All right? Christianity is about love. We should accept everyone. So he felt that it is wrong for churches to talk about, well, other Christians, um, other um, religions, other movements within Christianity as well. So he said, we shouldn't do these things. And he left. Now, is it wrong for a church to, well, talk about specific movements? Now, even talk about specific names, like we studied during prayer meeting, um, some errors that famous um, names are propounding. Is it wrong? Are we being critical? Are we being wrong? Now, if you read what Paul, the apostle, wrote to the young pastor Timothy, he says, he, I charge and I commit unto you, Timothy, my son, you young pastor, I charge you. Now, one of the things that pastors are charged to do and is committed receive this commitment to do, what is it? Look at verse 18, he says, now he says in verse 18, that you would do a, be a, um, fight a good war and have a good warfare. War, you say what war? Christianity about war? Here it is in scriptures. And furthermore, he says, the re the, this war is not your personal agenda. It's not you don't like someone, so you attack someone. This war, in verse 19, is about holding faith. It is about the Christian faith, the truth. And he says, and have a good conscience. And he said there are some that put away conscience concerning the faith. So they no longer feel that, well, I really need to teach the truth. For whatever reason, to be seeker sensitive, um, not to offend people, and um, to have well, more people come to church, or to continue to engage with other movements, other churches, so that they can be famous for whatever conscience, for whatever reasons. They set aside their conscience, and he says, concerning the faith, set aside their conscience concerning the faith, and have made shipwreck, means they have demolished, they have crashed the church because of the refusal to do warfare for the truth. Now, we don't like warfare. We don't like to have to do these things. But the church is charged to fight for the truth, to contend earnestly 
for the truth that was once delivered unto the saints. This is one of the charge on the church. Now, furthermore, it says in verse 20, Now, is it unkind? Is it wrong? Is it unbiblical? Is it unbrotherly to name names? Look at verse 20. And this is not the only place that Paul named names, of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom, have, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, he named specific names. And the fact that he would call out these names means these were well-known people. No point naming a name that people don't know about. And in fact, the more famous they are, the more dangerous it is because many people will take it as, well, what, what these well-known names in Christianity, and please know this, and Manasseh and Alexander, he is not talking about people who are non-believers, yet then of another religion. Now, he's talking about people within Christianity. He named names. For what reason? Because Paul is jealous of them. No. Paul said, this is about the faith. If I don't tell you who they are, I don't tell you what are their errors, the, the church, the believers, and the next generation will think that these things are fine and they will continue in it. And what will happen? Shipwreck. Have you been on a shipwreck? Paul would use the word shipwreck because he remember he shipwrecks in life. Real shipwreck, all right? Not talk about figurative words. How frightening it is that you can die from it. It is horrendous when shipwreck occurs to the church. When shipwreck occurs to the church, it occurs to its flock, its people's life. Imagine a pastor who would not deal with these things, take the church sailing, 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 but there, is a big, there are big holes everywhere and it's sinking and people are going to die and drown. And the pastor says, well, fine, don't talk about these things, you know. And people shout and say, there, there's problems. No, 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 everything is fine. Well, the Lord warned. There will be those that say, well, peace, peace, peace. No, don't worry, it's all peaceful. <laughs> but there is no peace and people are dying. So, the reason why we have this in basic Bible knowledge, now I want to establish this first before jumping in, is because, number one, we are charged to do that. Number two, because we love the Lord. We love His truth. We love sinners. We love souls. We do not want souls to end up in hell because of the wrong gospel and think that they are going to heaven. Matthew 7, Matthew 24 is very clear. There will many, be many that says, Lord, Lord, they think that they are Christians. They say, Lord, Lord. And the Lord will say, depart from me, I know you not. We love those souls. Paul loved those souls. That is why he said, you must expose error. Which parent? If you are a faithful parent and love your child, will warn your child about certain places, certain things, certain ideas, certain practices that will shipwreck their life. Which parent won't do that? All right, so please understand when the church does this. Well, of course, there are some that do it out of pride, do it in the wrong spirit, do it wrongly. Of course, there are those that are like that. But it does not mean that what is wrong is wrong. All right? It is not right to do it in the wrong spirit. Please remember that. So when you learn these things, don't become proud and go around... For the, for the sake of showing how clever you are, how holy you are, how more righteous you are than others, and go around criticizing. This is done out of love, out of a genuine care and concern for the kingdom of God. All right, so please remember that. Just because someone does it wrongly doesn't mean what they say is wrong, right? So let us, when we learn all this, remember why we are doing this. And don't go around and feel, well, it's all right. Other people can do this. I don't do this. I don't need to do this. I will continue to befriend this and be nice to them. You are not a true friend. Because one day, if they end up in hell, well, I'm supposing they can, they can talk to you, but yeah, they can't talk to you. But in their mind, they say, why did not so-and-so tell me that I was in the wrong gospel? Why didn't he or she tell me I thought he or she was my friend, right? So please be a true friend. Now, so with that setting, now actually, if you, if you turn, for example, to Galatians chapter 2, I'm just giving you samples, that's all, right? There are plenty of others. Galatians chapter 2, 
verses 11 to 13. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him. Let's read together. 12 to, uh, sorry, 12, 11 to 13, reading. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Peter, another apostle, was corrected by the apostle Paul. And he said, I confronted him to his face. And this is recorded in scriptures forever. I don't think Peter minded it. In fact, Peter continues to say, well, what the apostle Paul writes, and it is word of God, all right? Peter received that well. Peter was, was out of fear of the, the Jews. Now, he began to do the wrong thing, give the wrong idea. And I want you to notice verse 12. He said, so much so, sorry, verse 13, so much so that Barnabas also was carried away. Why did Peter do, why did Paul do this? Because he saw even good men, Barnabas, was now beginning to have the wrong idea. Paul did this for the sake of Christianity and for the sake of souls, all right? He doesn't say, Peter, my good friend. Peter, my senior. No, when the truth is the truth. The truth is the truth. doesn't matter who it, who it is, all right? So, with that, now let us turn to page um, 175, old book, 197 in the new book. Well, there are many other Bible verses. You can refer to them there. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. All right, it's printed there. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Titus, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So the emphasis to the young pastors and to the people is sound doctrine. Speak sound doctrine. So you cannot keep quiet. You have to speak it. And the aim is to commit thou to faithful men. That is what BBK is doing. To commit to you and I hope that you will be faithful. Faithful means you'll be true. You'll be loyal to the truth of God in this aspect. Will you be? So this is why we teach these things. Another reason is if you want to join church membership and you don't agree that the errors that we are going to study in the next few weeks, God willing, is something that you agree is, is wrong, then you should not join church membership because this is what we will continue to contend against. Now, there are four, all right, four, or maybe let's um, just have an overall view of false doctrines. There are some characteristics. So as a Christian, you must be able to identify quickly, all right, young or old. Now look at your BBK books. Now there are three ways which doctrines can be corrupted, three ways. Number one, by adding to it. So as we study the movements, you will see they add to the Word of God. They add their own thinking, beliefs, practices, they add it to the Word of God. Now, second one, by subtracting it from the Bible. Well, these doctrines don't teach because people don't like it. These doctrines, well, society don't agree with it, so don't teach. So how false doctrines begin is all this, add or subtract. That is why God warns in, in Revelation, do not add to my words. Do not subtract from my words or I will add these plagues unto you. Great warning. So don't take adding and deleting from the Word of God teachings or words lightly. God says, I will add these plagues to you. Then, number three, now if they don't add, but they don't subtract, right? So some say, they didn't add, they didn't subtract. But what 
do they do? Look at point number three. By distorting and misinterpreting it. Distorting and misinterpreting it. Some words are quite clear, but they want to, well, suit society or suit themselves, their own lifestyle. So they will twist the interpretation. Why do we spend a lot of time emphasizing? When you read God's word, please read it rightly. Read the context, all right? Make sure that you know theology, doctrine, study well, so that you know it doesn't contradict any doctrine across the Bible. Make sure it is consistent with the same kind of teachings in other places of scriptures whenever it's not clear. Why? Because if not, we will end up believing in twisted doctrines. All right? Twisted doctrine. Just like we studied at prayer meeting. Famous men will teach, if you do not come to God expecting reward, if you don't come to God wanting rewards from God, God is not pleased with you. Right? And today, people swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Famous men teach that. Must be right. They twist scriptures. Now, so these three ways, always, that's your first guideline. Is this sound doctrine? All right? Now, turn to the next page. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Reading. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and brought upon themselves swift destruction. Do you want BBCWA to be destroyed? Do you want yourself to be destroyed? Well, if you do not, then you must, you must submit to this truth. Now, Peter says there were false prophets. So, before his time, Christianity has already often been attacked by false teachers, subtract, add, or distort. But I want you to notice the second part. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, there shall be. This is a prophecy from God. There shall be. So please don't think that just because we want to ignore it, hide our head under the sand, and think there are no such things, then there are no such things. There shall be. Well, that is the reason why the church must War, a good warfare. A good warfare means it is for Christ, eh? not for your name. Now, and they will bring in damnable heresies. You will hear many today believe that they are Christians. Well, we're going to see one movement afterwards. And the world sees them as Christians, but they believe in damnable heresies. It means heresies that will damn souls to hell. Please know that just because it is huge in the world and many people are in that movement, they are all going to heaven. When God says, depart, I know you not, many shall say in that day, Lord, Lord. That word many is the Greek word for majority. All right? So don't think that majority means it's safety. It is not. Now then, look at chapter 2. Uh, look at, let's read Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Reading, as also in all his epistles, now he's writing about Paul, speaking in them for these things in which are some hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Now here Peter, although he was rebuked to the face by Paul, but what did he say? Well, please know what the Apostle Paul wrote. The Apostle Paul wrote many sound but very deep doctrines. They're very important for your life. See, he didn't say, oh, this sickening Paul embarrassed me in front of all the Jews and the Gentiles. No. You see, he was, Peter was concerned for the truth. And when he was wrong, I'm wrong. And then he says, listen to the writings of the Apostle Paul, which is from God. And he says, but he says there are things hard to be understood. And they're the unlearned and unstable. They rest. They twist. Now, why do we keep emphasizing, come and study God's word? Because if you are unlearned, you will be unstable. Don't think, I know how to be safe. I know these doctrines. And it's always the same thing. And you don't want to learn anything more. I know enough. It's very dangerous. Please know that. The more you know, the more you'll be able to discern. Is this false teachings? Are these false teachings? So the reason why we ask you to come is so that you do not fall into error. All right? So don't 
think that, well, I, I know enough, I can study myself. Here he says, some things are hard to be understood. That is why God called pastors. That is why God trained people so that they will be able to divide the Word of God rightly to help you understand. And you study long enough, you must be able to discern, is this true or not? Now, the doctrine of the church, all right, before we, we, we go there, we'll come to that um, soon. But now, we want to study four movements, all right? So, please remember these four movements. As far as I can, every week, I will ask you, what are the four movements that we must be aware of, all right? Four. Four. So, every week, I'll ask until it's drummed into us. Now, the first one is the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church. All right? The second one, if you turn to your BBK book, is the ecumenical movement. All right? The ecumenical movement. Then the third one is the charismatic movement. The charismatic movement. And then the last one, and it's often the most dangerous one, all right, is the new the new evangelical or new evangelical movement, all right? For, <laughs> all right? For key movements that is very, very prevalent, that is huge in Christianity today, or so-called Christianity for some, all right? That is why we are studying this. I'm not saying these are the only four, all right? Within there, there are, there are things that branch out. Remember, we studied in one of our church series, series, the progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity is another one, right? But I've covered that in great detail. Please go view the video. Progressive Christianity, which is very pervasive in many Christians' lives. So these four key huge official movements is what we need to be able to discern and know that these are wrong. Now, before I go into the first one, the danger is this. When we do not know the errors, we, number one, will think the church is critical. I hope that when you know the errors, you say, wow, this is serious, all right? Now, number two, if you do not know the errors, you will not be able to fight a good fight of the faith. You will not be able to defend the truth nor help anyone come out of falsehood. Now, please know this, Christians. We are called to be light. Don't think light simply means I be a good testimony, I'm loving, I'm caring, I share the gospel. Light means people are walking in falsehood, in darkness. You have to shine the theological, doctrinal truth so that they know. And then when they come out of the movements, if they're not saved, they get saved. And after they get saved, they live lives that would truly be useful to God. Please know that, all right? That is why we are learning all this, not to be critical, that's all. So now we start with not much time left. We start with the, uh, the Roman Catholic movement. Now, this is huge. Billions of people in the world are Roman Catholics. All right? My family, myself, we, we were a Roman Catholic family. We grew up as Roman Catholics. I was baptized, infant baptized as a Roman Catholic and so on. All right? So, now, what is wrong with this? Well, some of you may be familiar already, but I want to say this. Today, today, the Roman Catholics are quite different from what they used to be because many of them, they use the same lingo as you, the same language as you. They will talk about we are saved by grace. When you share the gospel, only Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ saves. Yes, I fully believe that Jesus Christ saved. Why, why, why do you disagree with me? And all those kind of things, all right? So they, the young generation of the Roman Catholics today, they are grilled with how to respond to the arguments against the Roman Catholic Church. And when they use all those words, it seems like it's the same as you and I, but they mean completely different things. Please know that. Because many of us, you say, Pastor, you, you are old-fashioned, you know. You are behind times. They are no longer like that. We should unite with them. We don't need to tell them to leave the Catholic Church. You know, you, you are really, you need to catch up with times. They have changed. Why do you keep teaching this? Change the BBK book already, right? You may think that. But I want to show you one thing. You see, the proof, the test is this. Have they changed? Have 
they change. Because many believe they have. And young people, they believe they, they have and they remain in the Catholic Church. And you don't think that you need to tell them anything. Have they changed? What is the best test of finding out whether they have changed? Maybe I ask you, what's the best test of knowing what BPCWA believes in? Well, our BBK book, right? Our basic Bible knowledge book, which tells you the beliefs of the church. We believe in the Reformed faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and then we have the list of things there, right? So the best is go to the source of the documents that the church uses to say these are our beliefs. So I can put on our website all our beliefs, but when I'm on the pulpit, I teach another thing. When I teach you what to do, what, how to live, I tell you another thing. So it is not about what they say, what the young generations say. It is what is still the official, doctrinal, stance, beliefs, conviction of the Roman Catholic Church is. That is what you must go back to. So don't be soft-hearted and all that because being soft-hearted is not going to help your friend to come to know the truth. You must say, what does the Catholic Church believe? Have they changed? Because today many Protestants are going back to unite with the Roman Catholic Church because they have changed, they say. Now, have they changed? So the way to convince you, and I hope will give you source to know how to deal with this, is to go to, well, the Vatican Council. You know what's the Vatican Council, right? The Vatican Council is the official highest council of the Roman Catholic Church globally that states what Roman Catholicism stands for and what they believe in. So the best is go to the source. If the source have changed, we gladly say, thank God, let's unite. Let's work together. But if the source has not changed, we cannot unite. We must continue to say, don't fall into their deception. So the deception today is far greater, far greater because of that. All right? So now, um, what should I do? Now, I go to what I'm going to tell you about what the Roman Catholic Church believes. I take it from Vatican.va. The official, global official, um, um, website, all right, of their belief. And I go to the catechisms of the Catholic Church. Like now what you're doing is catechism classes. Means what we teach you, what you should believe in, and this is how you should respond, all right? The catechism of the Catholic Church. So this is the official website, okay? You just go to vatican.va and their archives. This is taken just yesterday, all right? Please know. All right? Every time I teach, I take it again to make sure that they have not changed or they have changed. So this is just taken from yesterday. No change. So, so in there, they will have many parts. This is part three about life in Christ and so on. Now this, so everything that I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm not going to keep showing, going back and forth in this website. They are taken from this website. I will just document it. I'll pull out the relevant parts, all right? Others will spend a lot of time scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So this part is about justification, all right? And so on and so on. Okay, so now let me... So I pull out certain key ones, all right, certain key ones. All right, I'm going to talk about salvation because salvation is where it starts. Will, do our Roman Catholics believing in something that will save them from hell? We start there, all right? Now, let's read Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. What does the Bible say about salvation? Let's read together. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All right? Uh, sorry, ignore the merit to attain salvation. Now, so God says how, the Bible tells us clearly, how do we get saved? By grace. Means I don't deserve it. I ask God to save me. And through faith, means I believe in what God says about how, how I am saved. How, what does God say about how I am saved? What must I believe in? It is a gift. And he explained, what does it mean? It's a gift. It's not of works. It means it's nothing that you, should, you can do. Not anything that you do that can save you. Not a single thing. The most religious Christian thing you do cannot wash away one single sin. All right? So if you're wondering what Christianity is about, this is it. How to be saved, this is it. 
No amount of church attendance, no amount of water we throw on you for baptism, no amount of, of praying can save you. It is you cry to God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me because I cannot save myself. God, will you be merciful to wash away my sin? I want to turn away from my sins. Now, look at the second part. Now, it says we are his workmanship. means why do a Christian pray? Why does a Christian go to church? Why does a Christian obey the Bible? Why does a Christian do good works? For a simple reason. You are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. After you are saved, you are saved for good works. So I do good works. I obey the Bible because God ordained that I should walk in the Bible. God ordained that I should obey because I'm saved. Not in order I do baptism, I pray, I, do, I give money in order to be saved. No, I do all those things because I am saved. Now, this is what the Bible says about how you are saved. Does the Roman Catholic believe in that? Well, today they say, hey, come on, why are we still arguing about this? The hundreds of years old, we have changed. We believe that salvation is by grace, through faith. Uh, we believe that, all right? Can you please stop saying that we don't believe that? Do you know what they mean when they say that? They mean this. For example, I'm going to cover about baptism. Baptism. They believe grace, their definition of grace is this. There must be something that I do. When I do this, these things are means of grace. For example, baptism. Baptism is a means of grace. With, when I am baptized, this will impart saving grace to me. And I must believe that. So when they say salvation is by grace through faith, they, this word grace, you must replace it with the seven things, the seven sacraments that they believe brings salvation. They must put their faith in practicing these sacraments. That is what they mean. They say grace means God says, if you do this, I will graciously save you. But they conveniently ignore verse 10. Not of works. Verse 9, not of works. Don't talk about other works. Even the work of baptism will not save you, not of works. So, they, do they believe in salvation by grace through faith? They believe that they must put their faith in these sacraments, and one of the sacraments is baptism. So, 1992 is the number taken from the earlier website, right? So, I pull out certain ones, otherwise you go through so many things. Taken from intratext. Vatican.va. Now, it says this, Justification has been merited for us by the passion of Christ who offered himself on the cross as a living victim, holy and pleasing to God, and whose blood has become the instrument of atonement for sins of all men. Fine, we totally agree with that. Then it says, it adds this. Remember, add to the word. Add to the doctrines. They add, justification is comfort in baptism. And it's called the sacrament of faith. Do you believe in salvation by grace through faith? Yes. Justification, I get it, through the grace of baptism. Do you believe in grace by faith? Yes, this is the sacrament of faith. So that is what they mean. Now, what I'm trying to emphasize to you, has the Roman Catholic Church changed in their stance with respect to salvation? No, taken from just yesterday night. In their official catechism, means this is what they will teach the believers. But they teach a different thing. So please don't just hear the jargon and say, Pastor, you're backward. They don't believe this. No. If they don't believe this, this website would have changed. They still insist this is the truth. So that is what I'm trying to emphasize to you. Justification means this. Justification means you have sinned. But in order for you to be considered sinless, justified, how? Either by the blood of Christ that washes away everything and you're justified, or you do something. They believe you do something. Yes, the blood of Christ. So this is the forked tongue. You know the forked tongue? The forked tongue of Satan. Because you will hear on one side of the tongue saying the truth, and the other side of the tongue will add something to add this minus or distort the truth. This is the forked tongue. Everything fine until the full stop. The blood of Christ is our justification. But they say, oh, but then... They slip it in. Baptism is what justifies you. Is it the blood of Christ freely, graciously justifies us and then we live holy lives because we have been justified? Or is it your work 
of obeying baptism. Baptism is for believers. Baptism is for after you are saved. All right? We are going to have infant baptism afterwards. It's not about salvation. We'll talk about it afterwards. So, have they changed? No, they have not. All right? They have not. Now, they declare the, the sixth council, all right, in the papal encyclic, encyclicals, all right, the Council of Trent. Now, they declare this. If anyone say, if anyone dare to say, and this is taken from yesterday night, please know, the Roman Catholic Church still insists this is. All right. If anyone say that by faith alone, the impious is justified, means just now we read, right? We are saved by grace through faith. But say, if you say faith alone, that the unbeliever, uh, the impious is justified in such wise as to mean, means this is what you mean. Nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification. And in any way necessary, he's prepared. Then, and, and by the mo movement of his let him be anathema. So they say, you know, if you, anyone say it's by faith alone, you don't have to do anything to, to say, Lord, I, I will do this, I will do that. Then let him be anathema. Anathema. Anathema means let him be accursed. So today, the Roman Catholics still curse us who believe that salvation is by faith alone. Canon 12. If anyone saith that justif justifying faith is nothing else but confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that this confidence alone is that whereby we are justified, let him be anathema. Means, if you say my confidence, means my faith. My confidence is purely that Christ paid for all my sins and I depend on that and I don't need to add to that. Let him be anathema. So in their eyes, we are all cursed and um, should be excommunicated from, the, from Christianity. That is still their belief. But the Bible says, by grace through faith, Christ, you died for me. There's nothing I can do to add to that. And I put my faith in that. If you, if you believe in that alone, you can't be saved. All right? And so on, and so on. And then Canon um, 16, all right? Uh, 14, uh, 24, sorry. If anyone says that the just... That, just, that the justice received is not preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that the said good works are merely fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof. Let him be anathema. Do you know what it means? Let those who say this be a curse. Say what? Number one, that the justice received is not preserved and also increased through good works. Means I believe in Jesus Christ. I put my faith in His finished work. And I don't believe that I do good works purely because I'm saved. These are just proof that I am saved. Then let him be anathema. What is good works in the Christian life? We read just now in Ephesians, we are ordained. After you are saved, you are ordained unto good works. Meaning to say what? Let's look up here. Meaning to say, now after you are saved, after you are saved, you are created as a new creature in God. Now your good works is simply what God says you must do. It's the fruit, the fruits of your salvation, not the ongoing maintenance for your salvation. So this 24 means this. You must ongoing maintain your salvation by continuing to do good works. Means you can actually lose your salvation if you don't do good works. Now let me put it another way. As long as you believe that the Roman Catholics are right, I must continue to do good works and my justification to be saved is not increased. That's why I say eh, increase. My chances to be saved is not increased by good works, by obedience. Then I'm not saved. It means this. Jesus Christ's death is not enough. You must add your good works to Jesus Christ's work in order to increase your chances to be saved. That is simply put. That is what they are saying. That is why the Roman Catholics today believe if you, if, you, if you don't do this, don't do that, do th don't do this that we tell you to do, then, well, you're not saved. And so on, all right? Now, Canon 30. Sorry, I didn't put a carriage return. If anyone said that after the grace of justification has been received, to every penitent sinner, the guilt is remitted and the debt of eternal punishment is blotted out in such wise 
that there remains not any depth of temporal punishment to be discharged either in this world or in the next in purgatory before entrance to the kingdom of heaven can be opened to him, let him be anathema. So they say this, if you believe that you simply believe that Jesus Christ's work is complete and enough to save me, I cannot and I, there's no point doing any more thing because it's useless. Then you are anathema, you, should, you are accursed. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. It is finished. When Jesus Christ said it is finished, he's not saying, I have finished already. I'm gone. I'm, I'm lo I lost. When he said it is finished, what he meant was the work is complete, not I have lost. The work is complete. Why would Jesus say it is finished? No, it is, well, almost finished. You must do the rest. No, he said it is finished. So anyone who believes that the work of Christ is enough to remove every single debt of eternal punishment and every debt is blotted out, you are not saved. That is a false doctrine. And he said, no, then you must temporal punishment. What they mean is this. Well, if you commit a sin, we will tell you what to do. Give how much to the church. Do what for the church. And you do those things, then it erases those sins. That is not what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? The Bible told, Jesus Christ told the thief. Now, when the person next to him is crucified, Crucifixion is reserved for the worst kind of criminal. Please know that. All right? The worst kind of criminal for the worst kind of sin. Worst kind of crime. That was the thief next to Christ. Then when he believed in Christ, what did Jesus say? Let's read together. Then and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. All right? We read this, we learned this word paradise is heaven. All right? Today, today or, no, sorry, you know, I'm afraid you have to go to purgatory for a while before you go to heaven. No, today, the worst kind of criminal had no chance to pluck out the nails, come down and go and do penance and do good works. But Christ said, today, is this consistent with scriptures that you can increase your chances of going to heaven? Or if you can't, then you must go to purgatory or you must do something to to help yourself get into heaven? No. Christ said, it is finished. And that's why he can promise the thief. Now, let us also read Luke 16, 22. And it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. All right? You know the story, right? The event, the true event. Lazarus, the Bible says, he was carried where? By angels into purgatory, into a place of fire to burn for a while. No, he was carried into the bosom, uh, Abraham's bosom talking about uh, Abraham in heaven. Abraham, a place of safety. Now, let's read the last one. For Christ also has once suffered for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, this is the last nail in the coffin. Christ once suffered for sins. His work is done, complete, suff all sufficient, don't need to be done further by us. The just for the unjust. They keep saying, for your justification, you must, do, you must go through some suffering yourself. Then he might bring us to God. Once finished work, bring you to God. All right? So, this, I re-emphasize, taken from the Roman Catholic official catechism website last night. Have the Roman Catholicism changed? No, not at all. Right? In the future, we study more and more. I need you to be clear in your heart, dear friends. Let us pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from